ever wonder sometimes why things happen the way they happen? You ever wonder sometimes why you have to go through the things that you have to go through? You ever wonder sometimes what exactly is God doing in my life? Uh, I'm going to read chapter 21. It's not super long, but, but I, want you to, I want you to see this. And I'm, gonna, I'm not really going to preach through chapter 21 today. What I want to do is really just set the scene. And, 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 and I want us to recognize what's happening in David's life right now. This has to be a confusing, uh, difficult time for David right here. Okay, uh, I don't think that David really understands what exactly is going on. He was in the sheep, in the in the in the sheep flock. Okay, um, watching the sheep and everything was fine. And one of his brothers goes out and gets him and brings him in. And and some prophet pours oil on his head and anoints him king. And it's just like what? Then he goes and he fights Goliath. And and the next thing you know, he's playing the harp and stuff for King Saul and he's he's working in his in the in the in the palace there and as such it was I don't know what kind of a palace it was might have been a tent but anyways he was there and the next thing you know Saul is trying to kill him the next thing you know Saul is is after him and David is on the run and that's really where we catch up to him right here in in 1 Samuel chapter 21 so let me read this and we'll pray and we'll get we'll get started all right the Bible says here then came David to Nob to Ahimelech the priest and Ahimelech was afraid at the meeting of David and said unto him why art thou alone and no man with thee and David said unto Himelech the priest, The king hath commanded me a business, and hath said unto me, Let no man know anything of the business whereabout uh, I send thee, and what I have commanded thee, and I have appointed my servants to such and such a place. Now, therefore, what is under thine hand? Give me five loaves of bread in mine hand, and what there is present. And the priest answered David and said, There is no common bread under mine hand, but there is hallowed bread. If the young man have kept themselves at least from women. And David answered the priest and said unto him, Of a truth, women have been kept from us about these three days since I came out. And the vessels of the young men are holy, and the bread is in, in a manner common. Yea, though it were sanctified this day in the vessel. So the priest gave him hallowed bread, for there was no bread there but the showbread that was taken from before the Lord to put hot bread in the day in the day when it was taken away now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there uh, that day <clears throat> detained before the Lord, and his name was Doeg the Edomite, the chiefest of the herdmen that belonged to Saul and David said unto Ahimelech and and David said unto Ahimelech. And is there not here under thine hand spear or sword? For I have neither brought my, my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. And the, and the priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom thou slewest in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here, wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If thou wilt take that, take it, for there is no other save that here. And David said, There is none like that, give it me. And David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul, and went to Achish, the king of Gath. Okay. And the servants of Achish said unto him, Is not this David the king of the land? That was an interesting statement, wasn't it? Isn't this David the king of the land? Wait a minute, who is the king? I thought Saul was the king. Even the men here in Gath recognized that, uh, that David was to be king. Did they not sing one to another of him in, dan in dances, saying, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands? And David laid up these words in his heart, and was sore afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. And he changed his behavior before them, and feigned himself mad in their hands, and scrabbled on the doors of the gate, and let his spittle fall down upon his beard. Then said Achish unto his servants, uh, Lo, you see this man is mad. Wherefore then have ye brought him to me? Have I need of mad men, that ye have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, Lord, I pray that you would, Lord, help us to see what 
uh, you have for us here in your word. Lord, help us to understand what's going on. Lord, help us to understand uh, exactly um, what you would have us to take from this passage today. Lord, I pray that you'd help me to preach this message, preach the message that you've given me today. And Lord, I pray that your hand would be upon us all. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> I've entitled this message, The Making of a Man. And originally when I was thinking about a title, I, you know, I have, I have trouble with titles a little bit, trying to figure out exactly what I want to, you know, what I want to put on there. It doesn't really matter to any of you, but it helps me find them later in my computer, okay? And to kind of make sense of what they are. Originally I said the making of a king, but then I realized that God is more interested in making the person in making the man or making the woman or making the teen or making the child who he wants them to be, then he is making them into something like a king. God was more interested in David and making David the man God wanted David to be than he was in necessarily, I believe, making David the king. Because once David became the man that God wanted him to be, God could have used him for anything. He could have put him any any place that he wanted. God is infinitely interested in you and in me. And this is one of the struggles that I had in my life is I thought, well, God is going to call me into the ministry and I'm going to be a, a missionary and I'm going to go and I'm going to do. And I was all about what does God want me to do? And I didn't realize that for a while God just needed to work on me. He needed to work on Devin Dawson. And you know, it was 10 years from the time God called me to the ministry and when he actually opened the door for me to go into the ministry. And you know, it, it frustrated me terribly sometimes. What is God doing? Why is it taking so long? Am I gonna, is the door gonna open? And, and there were many things that hindered that. And I don't want to put myself on the par necessarily of David, but, but David, if you, if you do some studying, and, and obviously it's all just their best guess, I think we could say, but <clears throat> David was roughly about 20 years old at this time. And we know that he took over, he took the kingdom when he was 30, began to rule there about the time he was 30. So there was about 10 years that David was, was running from Saul, okay? And, 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 and I believe that David was in that same kind of a situation. What in the world is God doing? Why is Saul trying to kill me? What is, where, is, what, where is God in all of this? What are we, what are we supposed to do? And, and I think that we also recognize that, or we need to recognize um, what God accomplished in David's life in those 10 years. You see, here we are in chapter 21, and we have a young man that is, is I believe, scared, and I believe that he's confused, and he doesn't know what in the world God is doing. Why is Saul trying to kill me? I haven't done anything to, to make him mad. I've tried to serve him. I've tried to serve God. I've tried to be righteous before God. And all these things are happening. We see him on the run come here to Nob and to the priest Ahimelech. And we see him lie to Ahimelech. Oh, well, the king sent me on a business. No, the king is trying to kill you. Oh, I didn't, I wasn't able to bring a sword or anything because I was in such a hurry that I didn't pick up my sword. No, you were, you were running from, from Saul and you couldn't go back and get your, get your sword. And, and, and so we see that. And so I think the mistake would be to judge David according to the man that David became. We see him here uh, at the beginning of God working and molding and, 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 and doing. And, 
as, as God is working his, in his life, we really kind of have a, a chronicle of that in, in the book of Psalms. And we see many of David's struggles and we see how he didn't understand what was going on. And, and, and he felt many times that God had forsaken him and God had left him. And, oh, God, don't forget me here. And oh God, come to my rescue and, and judge my enemies and save me. And, and, and we see David pour out his heart really uh, a man who's trying to figure out what exactly it is that God had in, in mind for him and growing him in, in that way. Okay, in, in chapters 21 through 26 we find David in exile. We see him fleeing from Saul all over Israel. And <coughs> I was, I was having a hard time, and, and I kind of took a, a, a few weeks off of 1 Samuel because I was really struggling with what exactly am I, am I going to preach out of this. In fact, on Friday night, Saturday morning, when I was talking about what I was going to be preaching out of the book of 1 Samuel, uh, it wasn't this. It was really out. I was going to skip over this chapter and I was going to go right into chapter 22. And I had a and I and I still am going to preach that when I get there. Um, but the Lord, as I started studying and, and, and reading more and trying to figure out the Lord just opened opened uh, my eyes up to this. And, and 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 I think he directed this message this morning. And so what we see here in chapter 21 really is the beginning. OK, I can't preach all chapters 21 through 26. You don't want to you don't want to sit sit with me that long. Uh, but what he, God is doing is he is beginning to prepare the man. He is beginning to prepare the life. OK, um, yes, David was to be king. In, in many minds, David was the king, as we saw here when he got to, to, when he got to Gath. Okay? David was the king. But see, God recognized he wasn't ready to be king. God wasn't ready for him to be there, and, and he wasn't ready to be king. And God had some work to do. God had some, some sharpening and some honing and some refining and, 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 and all of that. Um, he was he was going to do a work in David's life. You see, God is more interested in the man than in the mission. God has put us here for a purpose, and I've preached that lots. God wants us to 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 be soul winners. He wants us to go out and witness, and He wants us to bring our friends and our family and and our coworkers, and He wants us all to bring uh, people to Christ. And He wants He wants the lost to be saved. It's not His will that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. And he wants He wants to save. That's why Jesus Christ came. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. And I and I preach that, and I preach that and and sometimes I think we can get ahead of ourselves a little bit and think that's what's most important but then we recognize that God is working on you and he's working on me and the and the man the person the woman the teenager their life their relationship to God I believe is ultimately more important than what God would have you do because really it is the clean vessel. It is the person who God, who is completely surrendered to God, the person who is completely obedient to God, who really is going to be able to go out and, and accomplish what God wants them to accomplish. You see, as long as there's anything between my soul and the Savior, God can't use me. I can go out and witness. I can go out and tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. I can go out and preach and hammer and, and do all of those things. But if there's anything between my soul and the Savior, God cannot use me. And if God does not do the work, the work will not get done. It is God who saves souls, not me. It is God who changes lives, not you. It is God that has to do the work. And so that is what God is involved with here. God is working on David. And, and we're going to see that <clears throat> David is going to be run all over Israel. I've got a map. Um, 
I don't know, it might have been in one of my commentaries or in the back of my Bible. And it shows David's trail as he runs from, from Saul. And he is all over the place. And he is, and he is running and, and he is trying. Um, but uh, God had a purpose in all of that. And God wanted to show David who David was and who God was. And that's really the point that we need to get to uh, in, each of our, in each of our lives, okay? Romans 8, 29 says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. What is God's purpose in our lives? That we would be conformed to the image of his Son. God wants our lives to be rid of all of all of this worldly stuff and all of this baggage that we have and the sin that, that plagues us and, the, and, and all of that. And he wants us to be conformed into the image of his son. And that's what God is doing in our lives. You see, God is in the business of making men and women for God. This is what glorifies him. This is what pleases him. And in order to do that, we need to realize two realities in our lives. Two realities. Number one, the reality of who I am. Who am I? Who was David? David was a young man. David was, was a godly young man. David relied upon the Lord. We can see his confidence in God. We can see his trust in God. We can see all of that. And we, when we see him go up and, and fight Goliath, and <clears throat> we can see that when, in, in many of the things in his early life. But David really hadn't been tested the way God was going to test him. David really, David wasn't ready to take on that responsibility. I've, I've preached this before that I believe that even, even the slaying of Goliath was preparation for later things in David's life. David was a young man and David needed to realize that like many young men do and many young ladies do, that we're not as great as we think we are sometimes. And many times we're all filled with ourselves and boy, I'm smart and I've got this figured out and boy, I'm strong and I can handle that and boy, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do it, right? We need to come to the end of ourselves many times. Come to the end of ourselves and recognize that I can't. I can't. And I have to turn to God. And when I turn to God, then I'm starting to get it figured out. That's where God wanted David. David needed to grow spiritually. He needed to mature as a man. Remember I said, he's only about 20 years old at this point. How much do 20-year-olds know? Now, I know the 20-year-olds in the crowd are going to say, we know lots of cool stuff, right? And Dalton is just about that age, aren't you, Dalton? You're right there at 20. He likes to call me a boomer. I have no idea what a boomer is, okay? But it's a derogatory term in case anybody calls you that and they're young, okay? And, 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 and he forgets who came to his rescue when he was however old and said, Dad, I'm done, right? And he thinks that he's going to teach me how to do whatever. Run the remote on the TV or figure out how to put the, the disc in or how to set up the camera, whatever the case may be, right? Um, we think we know all kinds of cool stuff, right? And all of his brothers are laughing right now. The only reason I picked on Dalton is he's 20, okay? They've all done the same thing. Right? It's not just Dalton who is who picks on on their dad and thinks that he's old and decrepit. OK, um, but 20 year olds think they know everything. Young men think they know everything. They think they can do it. They think they can handle it. They think they can fix it. They think that they can they can just do that. And, and, and that all had to come out of David's life. That had to disappear. Because God had something to do that no man could handle on their own. And they needed God, whether it be David or anybody else. And God had to get that out of there. God had to get all of David out of David 
so that God could work through him and God could accomplish something. We go back into the Old Testament uh, further and we see Moses as he was, as he was um, called on by God to lead this same bunch of rebellious people. You remember Moses? Okay. Moses lived as the prince of Egypt for 40 years in the lap of luxury so much as it was at that time. Okay. Moses thought he was something else. Moses even thought that he was going to be the deliverer of Egypt, I believe. And that's why he went to the rescue of his, of his, of his brother, of his fellow Israelite, and, and, and killed the Egyptian to save them. I really think that, that um, Moses had been talking to maybe some of his, his family or something, and he recognized that God was going to call them out of Egypt, and, and he saw his family, he saw his people in bondage, and Moses was wanted to lead them out of there and he was ready to do it but God recognized no you're not ready to do that even at 40 you're not ready to do that and so God exiled Moses out into the wilderness and for this next 40 years he chased a bunch of sheep followed them all over the desert and, 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 and worked with them and took care of them and protected them and, and all of that until God had finally gotten Egypt out of Moses. It took 40 years. 40 years putting it in and 40 years taking it out. And finally, Moses was at the point where God could use him. And you remember what happened to Moses? God said, I'm going to send you back to talk to Pharaoh, and you're going to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And what did Moses say? Oh, I can't do that. I can't even speak. I, 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 I can't. You remember 40 years before that, he was all ready to fight and go to war and, and to lead them out victorious. And now he can't do it. Why? Because God had emptied Moses out of Moses. God had gotten Egypt out of Moses. He had cleaned him up. He dusted him off. And he had got him, I believe, reliant upon God to the point where God said, okay, now, now you can go. Now you can go do what I've, I've asked you to do. And then he sent him back. And you remember at 80 years old, Moses started leading Egypt, or Israel. He led Israel out of Egypt. And for the next 40 years, he led that rebellious bunch of people around, around the wilderness. God had to prepare Moses. God had to prepare David. And God has to prepare you and me. If God is going to do something in your life, if God is going to do something in my life, he has to get us out of the way. And then he can work. Because I can't do anything for God. I can't accomplish anything for God in my own power. You see ministries, you see organizations, you see uh, colleges, all kinds of things built all over, all over the United States, even all over the world. And many of those things are built on, on people's abilities and people's charisma and people's ideas. But if it's to be done of God, God has to do it. There are lots of examples of God preparing his men, his people, for what he wanted them to do. You see, God cannot use us until we learn to completely trust him. Not my own ability, not my own strength, not my own intellect, not my own resources, but God. Take me down a peg or two or all the way to the bottom. Clean me out financially. Make me realize just how little I really know. And then God can use me. You see, God is more interested in you being who you need to be than what it is God has for us to do. Now, obviously, God has put us here for a purpose. God has placed Faith Baptist Church here in Lodgegrass, Montana for a purpose. There is a purpose. He has a plan. He wants to reach this area around here for, the, for, for His glory. 
to reach this area, to reach these people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But he's put this church here also to prepare us to go out and do that work. And God is working in our lives every day. In the circumstances and the trials and the difficulties and all of those things to make us usable for his honor and his glory. And God is not going to take any shortcuts. God is going to do what he needs to do. James 1 verses 2 through 4, the Bible says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Listen, God has a purpose in the trials. If you think that, that those trials are, are not supposed to be in your life, if you think that the Christian life is all about easy street and having what I want and, 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 and just enjoying life, you're wrong. Because God has something more for you. He is building you. He is perfecting you because he wants to use you. See, the truth is, David was not ready to be the king of Israel. God was still working on him, and God may still be working on you and on me. He will not be done until we completely learn to trust him. Until we learn the reality of who God is. Who is God? Till we learn the reality of his power. First of all, we need to learn that I can't, but God can. David learned God's protection. David was put in countless impossible situations, yet God got him through every single time. You read from, from chapter uh, 22, 21, 22 on, and you read where time and time again, David was backed into a corner. David was stuck in a cave, and Saul came in and slept in the cave, and David was on one side of the mountain, and the Israelites were coming, or the armies were coming around, and they had, they had David cornered. And, and time and time again, God rescued him from those situations. Time and time again, David was in a situation where God showed him beyond a shadow of a doubt that no way can I get out of this. No way, no way, no way. And then boom, God got him out of it. Time and time again until David recognized God can. I can't, but God can. And then that lesson was over. When you find yourself in an impossible situation, remember that God can get you through. Only God can get you through. Now, it may be a financial situation. It might be a health situation. It might be a relationship situation. There's all kinds of things. And we look at that and you say, there is just no way, no way, no way that this is going to work out. And God can get you through. You may be praying for somebody right now where you, that, or for someone right now that you say, there's no way they're going to get saved. There's no way they'll ever come to church. There's no way they'll ever listen to the gospel. But God can break through that shell. God can break through and break down that hard heart. Don't ever give up on them. Better said, don't ever give up on God. Because God can get through. It's not until you find yourself in those situations that you really learn to trust God. You may believe that he can. I think that if we talk to every person in here, and you would say, is God all powerful? Oh, yes, pastor. Amen. God is all powerful. Can God do this? Oh, absolutely. God can do that. Can God, could God tear this whole world down and melt it down to, to the very elements and start over and recreate it? Oh, absolutely, pastor. God could do that. Could, can God save your mom and dad? Absolutely not, pastor. They're beyond his reach. You know, when it gets right down to it, we, we give a mental assent. You say, oh, absolutely, God can do anything. And then you make it specific and say, can God work in this person's heart? Oh, he's pretty hard. Can God start a church in Breckenridge, Michigan? Oh, that's a pretty hard area. Can God build a church in Lodgegrass, Montana? Oh, that's a pretty hard area. Can God? 
Where's our faith? We bail out on God. In one breath we say He can do anything, and in the next breath you say, oh, well, that's pretty tough. God can do anything. You know, it's, I was thinking about this, and you think about a life preserver. Have you ever <coughs> taken your, your little kids swimming, and maybe the first time they've been in a pool, or first time they've been in a lake, or something like that, and, and, and they're afraid of the water, and you put a life preserver, a little bitty life jacket on them, and you go to put them in the water, and a lot of times they'll recoil at that. It's like, oh no, don't let go, don't let go, let go. And then you let go of them, and they recognize finally that that life preserver will hold them up. But they don't recognize it till they test it. They don't recognize it till they have to rely on it. They don't recognize it until everything else is gone. gone. Dad's hands are gone. Mom's hands are gone. Everybody's backed away. And now they're floating in the middle of the pool with, with, with that life jacket or water wings. We used to have a pool when we lived in Michigan. And the kids would put their water wings on and they'd jump out there. And they thought then they thought they were indestructible. They could go, they could go anywhere with that. Until we really... Rely on God until we really have to rely on God. Our faith is not what it needs to be. Until we have nobody else and only God, and then is when God makes the point. The reality of His power. And then David learned God's provision. It's amazing. God, David roamed all over Israel with over 600 men in his army. And that bunch, they, they ran from Saul here and ran there and, and ran all over the place. Did you ever think about who was feeding this army? Who provided for them? Have you ever cooked for 600 people? That's a lot of people. Have you ever bought the groceries for 600 people? Right? That's a lot of people. Have you ever read about who it was that was attracted to David? Who it was that came and served under David? Look at chapter 22 and verse 2. The Bible says here, And everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented, gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them. And there were, there were with him about 400 men. Now by the time we get to chapter 23 and verse 13, we see that there were over 600 men. That number continued to grow. But did you notice something about those people? Everybody that was discontented, everybody that was in debt, everybody that had nothing came to David. How did he provide for them? David didn't have anything. David wasn't able to buy groceries and, and cook and all of that for them. God provided for them. David learned that it was God who protected them. David learned that it was God who provided for them. God sustained them. And then David, David realized not only the reality of his power, but the reality of his faithfulness. We must not only learn that God can, but we must also learn that God will. Now, I want you to recognize, first of all, when I say that, that God will. <clears throat> let's not try to put God in a box. And what I mean by that is let's not put God in this box. And I've preached on this before, where we think we can just open the box and pull God out when we want him. A big G God doesn't fit in any box. If you want a little G God, he'll fit in your box. And you can pull him out and dust him off and, 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 and think that he's going to do something for you. But the reality is, that kind of a God won't. But God Almighty, the creator of the universe, the God of the Bible, the big capital G God will not fit in your box. So when I say that God will do something, what I mean is, is that God will perform his promises. God will do what he said he will do. But don't think that you can just conjure up something in your mind and say, God's going to do this because I believe he's going to do this. No, no. Will God perform his, his purposes? Absolutely. Will God do his will? Absolutely. Will God 
provide and protect and, and all of that for you as he's promised? Absolutely. But don't think I can just come up with my own plan. Many times we do that in our lives. We say, you know what? I think I'm going to do this. And halfway down the road, we say, oh, God, bless this mess that I'm in. God's not going to bless that mess that you're in if he's not the one that put you in that mess. Okay? Not, obviously, God sometimes allows us to get into a mess, and he helps us to get through that. But don't think you can just come up with your own, your own ideas. I have come up with all kinds of schemes and ask God later to just rubber stamp it. Say, God, this is what I want to do. I need your blessing, right? It's kind of like going to the principal's office and say, I need your signature. Just sign here. Don't read it. Okay? Let me go. Cannot ex expect God to do that. However, if God has promised, then God will. Has God promised to forgive us? Then he will. Has God promised to save you? Then he will. Has God promised to provide for your every need? Then he will. Has God promised to be with you when you need him? Then he will. Has God promised to never leave you or forsake you? Then he will. Has God promised to lead you and direct you? Then he will. If God has said it, if God has promised it, then he will do it. We can take that to the bank. We can trust in him. Too many times people, Christians, don't want to obey God because they're afraid that something's going to go wrong. Oh, I can't do that. What would happen if... Wait a minute, did God tell you to do that? Did God promise to provide for you? Then obey. Don't worry about it. This is the point that David had to come to. David had to recognize who he was and that he was not able to perform what God wanted him to perform. He was not able to be the king. He wasn't able to provide that. And then he had to, he had to understand that God was able, that God was powerful and that God would provide and protect and that God was faithful to do what he had promised. And then David could be king but only then you see when God has completely emptied you out of every last bit of self-reliance and self-righteousness then he can really use you then he can entrust you with whatever task it is that he has in mind for you right now God is working in your life I don't know what God's doing I think that every one of us are at a different stage of sanctification and a different stage of development, a different stage of maturity. But God is working on you. Don't fight him. Obey him. Follow him. Surrender to him. Say, oh God, do what you want with my life. Empty yourself out. Let there, not, let there be nothing between your soul and and the Savior. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this time, for this day, for this message. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in my heart. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in the lives of, of, of these folks here. Lord, I thank you so very much for all that you're doing at Faith Baptist Church. Lord, I thank you for all that you're doing at Bible Baptist Church in Breckenridge. Lord, I thank you for all that you're doing in churches like that scattered all over the United States and all over the world. Lord, I pray that Christians would get out of your way. Lord, I pray that Christians would empty themselves and surrender to you. Lord, I don't know what's going on in lives today. I don't know what everyone's struggle is. I don't know the trial that that everybody is facing but I know that you're in it if they're a child of God then you're in it and you have a purpose for that trial you have a purpose for that testing you have a purpose for that for that darkness maybe that we see and that that questioning the lack of understanding we don't always understand what you're doing I'm sure that David asked Time and time again, oh Lord, what are you doing in my life? It's been five years. It's been six years. 
It's been eight years. It's been nine years, Lord. What are you doing in my life? And then it was ten years. And God gave him the kingdom. Lord, help us just to trust you. Though we can't see, though we don't understand, though we just can't, help us to trust you. I thank you so very much for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen.